I am here with my guests, Chris Barnes and Zahid Bardai, and we are doing a special locker room for growth. We're going to talk about heavy metal and hard rock, which is something that's near and dear to all of our hearts. But first, I want to learn a little bit more about my guests. So take it away, you, Chris, Zahid. Tell us a little bit about yourself and who your favorite band is and why. You're up, Barnes. Oh, let's see. Let's see. He and I are friends. I'm from New Jersey. He's from Canada. We actually instantly bonded over our love of heavy metal and loud music over a cheesy Slayer ringtone on your Nokia 2005 phone. It started from there. We were both at a get together for a common friend who I met in college, literally in a room full of people because I heard him say, oh, I don't like those bands. I like In Flames. They're this Swedish melodic death metal band. And I looked over across the room like it was something out of like a, <laughs> <laughs> like what? You know the, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. And as Barnes said, I'm from Canada. I worked in radio in Quebec and community radio. That sort of took me to New Jersey for grad school. I worked at the radio station at the, at the college there. I have always loved music, even when it was like really forced upon me. I mean, growing up in a South Asian household in, in suburban Toronto, parents push you to do piano because that's, what's going to get you to med school. It did not work that way for my mom, because when I was a teenager, about 1996 is the first time I heard Slayer. I was instantly hooked. I worked in a skate shop. I went in there after my classical piano lessons and the owners loved Iron Maiden and Slayer and all of these bands. And it just blew my mind what music could be. Fast forward through the years, I went to New Jersey, I met Barnes and we've been friends in metal and hockey ever since. So this is a really cool way to tie it all together. I guess my favorite band, which I learned of in 2012 is a band called Sabaton. I love them because every song, every album is a concept based around a different political or military conflict throughout history. So every song is a heavy metal history lesson. And I love that. Of course, it's no uh, secret what my favorite band is. <laughs> I don't even know how many Judas Priest concerts I've seen, but I love the Rob Halford's voice, the range that his voice has. And even today, even as singers usually lose their voices as they age, he can still hold it. His voice is, he doesn't go as high as he used to. Well, he can go high, but there is a range that he can't hit as well as he used to do when he was younger, but he still has it. It's just incredible. But what I love about metal, what, oh, just hard rock and metal to me, the guitar licks, the guitar licks just send me into another world. I just love the guitar licks. So that's, that's why I love it. Yeah. As somebody who has no musical ability whatsoever, there's some things about like the sonic dynamics of it, like the high pitched screeching or even like the lower end chugga chugga chug stuff. That like, it just, I don't know, it just connects to me. It just, it's there. In... And the voices, like they all say, oh, they're just screaming, but you gotta have opera training to sing like that. If you don't have training on your voice to sing metal, you're gonna lose your voice in the first half of the song. <laughs> I, I think one of the things that I love and you compare it and contrast it to, you know, pop culture music today where it's all auto-tune and you could sing in a speaking range and then engineer it up the wazoo until it sounds yeah. like something beautiful. But with metal, it's very little processing involved, but you can have people who can sing like Halford, the metal god, obviously. And then you can have the Angela Gossows or the Alyssa White Glooses of the world from Arc Enemy who bring that to it. And it's, it's amazing because there's so many different ranges that you can bring into this one genre of music and compare that to what a lot of other people are listening to. It's kind of all the same. 
And you mentioned that range, and I see that in one band in particular, Pantera, where they will go the traditional metal voice, and then they will go that other voice <laughs> all in one song. It's incredible, the range. So metal does get a bad rap. And I remember back in the 70s where one of the first early concerts that I've seen, I saw Alice Cooper. He played in Edmonton right after he was in Vancouver and he had fallen off the stage. He was bandaged up when he oh, sat here. And he was late in Vancouver because he he wanted to finish watching a hockey game. <laughs> so that was like big news. But in those days, I remember when he was touring, that tour, there was a court case happening about Judas Priest. These parents were taking Judas Priest to court. I, I have to look it up. And, but they were taking them to court because their son committed suicide. And he was pl playing nonstop Judas Priest before that. So they, of course, had to blame the band for a suicide. And that's when that stuff all started, I think. And yeah. move forward to Tipper Gore days. <laughs> and it was so interesting that, you know, in all these American Senate hearings they were having on this, which is really crazy that, oh, there's a million things going on in the world, but we're going to argue about some old Black Sabbath lyrics in Twisted Sister. <laughs> but the fact that John Denver came out and he was like in support of all of metal, he's like, nope, it's all good. It's art. Deal with it. Because he was such a beloved in the antithesis of all those bands that you were talking about in the 80s. And <laughs> yeah. Like, this he is was. the guy who recorded a Christmas album with the Muppets. <laughs> I, I think the best thing that came out of that was the warning label on all the CDs. Because <laughs> to me, when I see that word, oh, I guess that's for me. <laughs> that's what I was looking for when I, you know, in the early 90s, when I was looking for punk rock, right? I was looking for that parental advisory logo. So thank you, D. Snyder and the PMRC for that. <laughs> He's always front and center, and, and him and Zappa were the face of that. Speaking of uh, D. Snyder, have you heard his new album? Or actually, he's had two of them. I have not. Oh, like, a little stuff? bit of it, I think. You should. They're produced by Jamie Josta from Hatebreed. It's D. Snyder singing modern metal style <laughs> production. It's awesome. It's worth checking out. I like you his know, Christmas album. During the pandemic, D. Snyder was saying, oh, what was it? Was it? Because conservatives wanted to use the we're not going to take it as how, you know, conservative values were being infringed. And D. <laughs> Snyder said, you know, I forget the exact quote, but it was classic D. Snyder. It was how the in the war on Ukraine, they could use we're not going to take it as an anthem, but anti-COVID maskers and deniers couldn't use it to f support their conservative yeah. values he said one is about people fighting up for what's right and against oppression and the other is an infantile feet stomping and then it's amazing how that has brought d snyder back into the public spotlight he's always been around but it's like his words are timeless it's really interesting how that voice of the generation from the early 80s and the late 70s is still really cogent today but again you look at all like the big twisted sister songs like we're not going to take it i want to rock they're just such timeless simple feeling uh, like a guttural everyone feels that way at some point yes you know, yeah. whether you're enraged or you just want to party like <laughs> everybody there you could go anywhere on the planet and talk to someone like have you ever been angry yes then listen to this song oh yes i agree with that so this is really interesting because Rob Halford said in, it was like a banger TV production that Sam Dunn had put out. And in the interview, Rob Halford said, music is for, it's about excitement, it's about power, and it's about being angry to the point of exploding. So as we were just talking about feeling, how does that statement resonate with you? Because I view metal as something completely different than just about anger. No, I completely agree with you. If you listen to a lot of the Swedish bands, like In Flames and Dark Tranquility and even Soil Work, there's this certain kind of acceptance in, of like nihilism. So it's not anger, it's angry sounds, but there's a certain kind of feeling about that. Or if you listen to stuff like uh, more hardcore stuff, like Life of Agony or Biohazard, which is about depression, frustration, that the fact that you can go into a 
a mid-sized venue with 1500 people who everyone there likes the same music as you do they understand that same feeling that you know is being sung or discussed about openly and that you can share that with someone is a really powerful feeling i find it's an escape too you can use it as an escape now there are two bands there's two particular albums that i have to play if i'm so pissed off i could kill someone these are the two albums that calm me down <laughs> ramstein du host <laughs> and Limp Biscuit's Chocolate Starfish album. Those two, of course, that one is iconic because it's F every second word in every song. Those two albums, whenever I get so angry that I almost lose control, I have to throw that music on. Even though I can listen to that music even when I'm calm. So I was just gonna say, then does listening to that, does that make you happier? Yes. Or does that compound the, the anger? It validates my anger, but it also makes me happier. <laughs> See, for me, it's At the Gate Slaughter of the Soul. That album, I think it came out like 96, between 96 and 98. That album changed my life. I had never heard extreme death metal before and Swedish death metal at that. I had never heard that before. And that album it's highly regarded in metal circles. It's the one album that it doesn't matter if I'm really angry or really happy. I can listen to it no matter how I feel. Well, because I think that there's such a fine line emotionally between happy and angry and like that mm -hmm. album, it's got this very intense, like da -da 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 -da, like drum beat to it that, you know, gets your heart going, whether it's a fight or flight for good or for bad. It's powerful. There's anger. There's a frustration to it. But then you listen to these guitar solos and harmonies and stuff that are going on that are just like the opposite. It's like, listen to that. that that's amazing. It's how did they do that? You know, there's a musicianship behind it. Yeah, there's, it's almost like a, a bit of like a bipolar catharsis, right? Because it's just such opposite ends of the emotional spectrum when you have the death grunt and then you have these blistering guitar licks that make you happy with the skill and the musicianship. It sort of transcends emotions. It's complex. It's, you can be happy, you can be sad, you can be angry, you can be mourning, you can be optimistic, all in the same piece of music. Okay, so here's another question, because we're all communicators and we all listen to a genre of music or genres of music that are not typically thought of when you think of like professionals in the working world. So how does your musical identity play into your communication or your professional identity and what you do? Hmm. That's, That's a, a very good question. <laughs> it's very I complex and I recognize that. It's a great question. I, I, I think for me, and I, I know this is kind of a weird tangent, so bear with me as I'm kind of flushing this out live stream as you talk about it. Like you listen to hardcore, you listen to death metal, you love really cheesy power metal. Like that's a part of your identity because it's something that you know and understand that other people aren't necessarily going to be into. But you know what? I love Hammerfall and this is the greatest thing to meet in the world to me that you wind up getting this sort of a self-confidence about yourself. So whether you're presenting you know, professionally to your boss, to a prospective client, if you're at a conference, you kind of understand that logic. Like there's a confidence you have, like, this is me, this is what I like. So professionally, this is what I do. I know this is a good project and I want to talk about it. It's like being so passionate about something because people like metal, either they love everything in it. Like you said, either they're into Kiss, but they'll also tell you about their favorite Napalm Death album. Like it's a whole lifestyle that you're completely into. I think with your work, it's like that whole feeling of all in and you kind of, this is my project and I'm going to make it be awesome. See, for me, if I'm writing something, I need the machine gun drumming. I need the da -da 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 to, to get those creative juices flowing as I write. And as I get my flow, it's interesting. Cause as we were talking about how the music can have machine gun drumming, but then it can have really melodic vocals. I find that really carries me through into the next thing that I'm doing. I don't think it clouds my emotions while I'm writing or while I'm doing something because I would never turn in a professional piece that says something like kill kittens or something like that. Right. But it really, yeah, it really starts me on a creative path when you have that, that really heavy intro. And when you've got music with guitar and vocals that sort of 
carry almost like a sweet sound it really inspires me to keep going or it inspires my creative juices to keep flowing i find if i'm writing it's difficult for me to listen to music when i'm writing because it, i lose my concentration <laughs> you just get so into it i know right I also can't listen to music when I sleep because it'll be like an hour later. Oh, I like that song too. <laughs> oh, I am missing my... Any other time when I'm just doing tasks on the computer and, and like particular PR tasks, if you're doing, looking for context, media stuff to place and doing all the different things that we do, I find it's easier to listen to. I get into moods for certain bands. I get into moods for certain genres as well. But to me, music is just part of life, right? For me, I need, I need, almost need a tune for everything I, that it's weird. It's almost like I need that noise to focus. If I'm traveling for work or whatever, and I'm in a hotel room, I will always turn on Fox news to help me go to sleep. Nothing <laughs> else works for me, but Fox news to put me to sleep. Right. If I'm working, I need really heavy metal. I'm trying to get my two-year-old into heavy metal. It's a hard, it's a hard battle because. There's the blippies and the Sesame Streets of the world that, that take his attention. But if I'm cleaning the house, I need to listen to a specific style. The other day I tried listening to the new Kid Rock album and that just, that did not work for me. <laughs> See, I, I have it the opposite. I have a three-year-old at home and she loves Sepultura. But I think it goes down to her talk about like those guttural things like Max Cavalera sounds a lot like Cookie Monster. She likes Cookie Monster. This is Cookie Monster with loud guitars and these really cool drum patterns and stuff. Like, especially the Roots album. Mm. Like, that's her jam. I need to try that. I need to try to make that association for him. Yeah, no, no. It's like, it's the bridge. She's like, this sounds like Cookie Monster. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Oh, I like Cookie Monster. I like this. It's loud. Well, the one thing we do know is music is personal. It's very personal. So it's when we were younger, oh, our parents would be, oh, what are you listening to? And now <laughs> we as parents, well, maybe not we, but we see parents that those kids today are going to their kids and say, oh, what are you listening to? <laughs> it doesn't really matter whether it's One Direction or Taylor Swift or what it is. Music speaks to each of us individually and in many different ways. And it's, and it's in the ear of the beholder. And it can be like completely different. I think that's the great part about it is that it completely can kind of, have, again, the same thing. You, you could talk about it like you're saying, oh, we're going to play this Pantera album. And then someone will be like, this is noise. This is great. Or it just speaks to people differently. And I think the other thing is that music finds the right person to listen to. Yeah. You stumble across something and then you're like, I like this. And this is now part of my regular rotation. Or conversely, you're like, what the heck is this? Because <laughs> that's happened and I've, I've listened to things and I'm like, I don't get this at all. I'm sure it makes someone very happy. And then there's the mashups. You've got Judas Priest playing with any of those really? songs live. And it was pretty cool. That's it. It's all these different weird combinations of stuff. Have you guys ever heard of Poppy? No. No. So Poppy's like this, it's a singer, songwriter, indie vapor where... Lady Gaga. You've got uh, Def Leppard playing with Taylor Swift. <laughs> I think one of my favorite albums of all time is the Linkin Park Collision Course with Jay-Z. I haven't heard that. That would be cool. I did get to see one of the few times they performed. It's like they call, I don't know what they call it, but it's all this really dream synth poppy stuff that like... The youngsters like on the YouTube, she did a traditional metal album. It was on Sumerian records. So there's credibility on this already. It mixes like modern pop style music with a little bit of like the J and K pop and like chug a chug guitar riffs. But that's the point of it is you can put together all these different parts of things that shouldn't go together and you're going to, you can possibly come up with something awesome or interesting to listen to. I like the influences where you blend, like Limp Bizkit blends a little bit of rap with their their metal and then you've got baby metal which is com something completely different and then i've seen rob halford play with baby metal as well but so there's some really interesting combinations and particularly going like overseas to see polish metal or japanese metal oh i love the bees <laughs> there's this a taiwanese metal band called katonic and they they add elements of like traditional eastern asian folk music and with this you know 
this cookie cutter, what you would expect from a Norwegian black metal band. I mean, it's cool. It's just interesting watching how these things all pop into it. It's like a recipe. You can combine certain things and you'll have the greatest dish ever. Then other times you're like, this is just awful. What was I doing? But you never know what you're going to get. I think it's one of the cool things about live music is that you can go say, this is the headliner I want to see. I'm going to struggle through these two or three support acts to get there. Sometimes you'll walk off buying a shirt and a CD and be like, oh, that was awesome. This is my new favorite band. And other times you're like, you know what? Maybe you're going to go stand by the uh, snack counter and get an extra coker. The first time I saw Chthonic, I had heard of them through Barnes, but I had never seen them or heard the band before. And my mind was blown. It was 2014 at Wacken in Germany or Wacken in Germany. There was a, about a hundred thousand people at that festival. I had never heard them before. There were so many people around me that had never heard them before, but I found that as the show went on, because it was so different and experimental to us, we tended to gravitate towards the front of the stage and, oh, I can't even remember how many thousands of people were there. And it harkened back to that documentary global metal by sam dunn i don't know if you've seen it but it just looks at how heavy metal has been absorbed and interpreted around the world and so to see that band and then there was a chinese metal band and i forget the name right now but they were amazing too and it's unfortunate because at their show it was it was really pouring rain and there was probably about 10 people but i am in the youtube video of of that show so well, i am somewhat famous but it was for me it was really eye-opening to see so many different people from around the world accepting experiencing this these new genres or these new frankensteins of heavy metal i find just the era like back in the 80s where it seemed to blossom and grow from in that era that was like such a hard rock era and to me those were like the best memories ever <laughs> some of the best concerts ever and i've been to a lot in fact i've been to so many concerts i try to list them all there's a few that stand out in my mind but one was grand funk railroad and their drummer oh my god unless you were at that concert you have never seen a drummer. <laughs> he used his head, he used everything. And he was, it was just incredible. I've seen a lot of great drummers, but I've never seen anybody use what he used in that performance. And that was particularly in one song, The Railroad. And that when I had the album before I went to the concert, I thought, that sound in the album was a piped in train, but it's him drumming. <laughs> it was crazy. It's very difficult to find that clip online, but there is another clip of him that I think I posted on Facebook last week where he was doing similar antics to another song, a lesser known Grand Funk song, but that was a very memorable concert. Another one was Judas Priest in Edmonton. I think it was 2011. And it was at the Shaw Convention Center, which is a very small venue for a concert. It, it, it was 5,000 seat, but the way the venue is set up, it was so intimate, which is where the picture behind me comes from. It was such an intimate setting. You just felt like you were almost at the stage. So even if you is, were sitting in the stands, it was great. Is the Shaw Convention Center, is that the one where you have to go down the escalator and it's... Yes. Okay, that's where I saw Slayer on the farewell tour in Edmonton. And that was really interesting to me because one thing that stands out, so that was Slayer, Anthrax, and I, th I want to say Testament. And what really stood out to me was, you know, nowadays everyone, so back in the day, you weren't allowed cameras, you weren't allowed any sort of recording devices. Now it's gotten to the point where who really cares? I mean, everybody's got that in their pocket anyways. And to take it one step further, I love live tweeting concerts. I love sending clips of what I'm seeing or, or what I'm hearing. And it was funny because there was a wedding that was going on above us. So <laughs> it, I mean, Barnes, you've never been to this place, but you go down a really long escalator, almost like the CNN escalator down into kind of like a basement. 
Sorry and to interrupt, but you do realize, know that the CNN escalator is the world's largest escalator. Yeah, and it feels and it like it was this. originally installed there uh, when it was the Sid and Marty Croft Studios. <laughs> I know a lot about Ted Turner things, so I'm going to go back to a oh, cool. I think you tell the story. So you go down this this what feels like the world's longest escalator, especially when you're waiting on it to yeah. get to the you. There's a lineup to wait to get in. Yeah. And so we were on this escalator. We're in this, sorry, we're in the show. I was taking pictures, I was taking video and I was on Snapchat. And you know how on Snapchat you can like swipe to see filters or whatever. And then based on your location, if somebody has purchased a geofencing for their event, you can add to it. And the wedding above us was, oh. was it, it was an ethnic couple. Cause I remember the names. And, you know, Anthrax was doing like a gang vocals with the audience type of thing. And so they were like, everyone go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I recorded that. And then I swiped left or right. And I found the filter for person X and Y's wedding. And <laughs> so I, I just, let me add to their memories. So I just added it to their snap filter. And so when they were going through, I'm sure when they were going through their wedding clips later on, they were like, why are there random videos of anthrax and slayer in our wedding memories <laughs> it's always interesting awesome. <laughs> when you see stuff like that when worlds are colliding so living in new jersey atlantic city is a weird mix of casinos and restaurants and venues because well you got to get people there so imagine how weird now in new jersey on a atlantic city on a weekday it's a lot of senior citizens because that's what you do. You got nothing to do. So imagine they're there for the early dinner special and there's me and oh, 2000 people who are all excited to see the hate breed show all wearing our cargo camouflage shorts and our favorite black hoodies and stuff. You're watching them, you know, everyone's staring at each other. Like there's going to be a fight between, you know, Jerry and her walker over. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, just remember yeah. the seventies people are now in their eighties. So Oh, they're, they're still tough. But that's the other part of it. I know. That, like, and you always know when you're in a bar, the bars that I always went to were the check your knives and guns at the bar. So you got your drink and you see the bikers or you see somebody like doing the shuffle that there's going to be a fight. You immediately pick. It's like an automatic reaction to pick up your drink because otherwise when they hit your table, your drink goes fine and you lose it. And you got to buy another one. <laughs> But yeah, it's always interesting that you see these. It's like George Costanza said, worlds are colliding. <laughs> it's so true. But I often worry sometimes because you hear your parents or whatever talking about the music that they rebelled to or wh whatever it may have been. Nowadays, they've gotten much softer. And as I grow older yeah, and as I become an older parent or whatever, I don't ever want to lose that love for heavy metal. You know right? what I mean? I mean, I will always love like the Buddy Hollies and the Elvis Presleys and whatever. There's that movie SLC Punk from back in the day with Matthew Lillard and his whole thesis was about keeping it real and not selling out. And in one of the most memorable scenes, his, his dad in the movie, I forget his name, the actor, but he was Shooter McGavin from Happy Gilmore. He stopped Matthew Lillard and he said, son, I didn't sell out, I bought in. That is a oh. very powerful message for me. And I, I don't ever want to sell out and I will buy into, I just bought a minivan. So I will oh, buy in. Congrats. Oh my God. Thank you. <laughs> I, I will buy into what dads need to do, but I don't ever want to sell out as a metal fan. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the other part of it too. There's a certain evolution you do as a fan or what your interests are. And that's how you stay relevant in your own life and adapt. I mean, look at Metallica. So what, State Anger might not have been really the best album or anything, but they tried something different. And if you look at some of the stuff on their last two albums, like Moth to a Flame and Hardwired is just as good. It's just as good a banger as like, the you know, their big stuff. So you change and you grow. Not everybody, whether it's professionally, personally, or sonically, is like ACDC and it's like, well, we have perfected the formula of how we're going to live our life. And this is the way we're going to be for till the, our last breath. And everyone's going to be cool with it. But you figure out how to incorporate these things into your life and how you do it. I, uh, I work in a public library, so I have all kinds of various degrees of dressing. Like today is my print shop day. So if you look at me, I'm not as fancy as I would when I'm say hosting a chamber of commerce event or going to a grant meeting, or even as fun and happy if I'm going on a community outreach. 
But then there's certain days where I want to dress and be moderately fancy or whatever. So I'll wear my nice Iron Maiden t-shirt and I'll put a blazer over it. And everyone's like, oh, you look <laughs> handsome today. And I'm like, thank you. Can I play with madness? <laughs> that's so Barnes. <laughs> but that's that's kind of what you do. I think that's the thing is, is that you can be authentic. You can be true to yourself. You don't have to be 60 years old and look like Beavis and Butthead wearing your 40-year-old Metallica yeah. t-shirt everywhere you go Speaking to be like, look. 60. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm well, not going to stop being a metal fan or wearing my Judas Priest t-shirts either. So There's that. But then like, there's the other part of it is, is like when you wear your Judas Priest t-shirt or like you got your Kill Switch Engage pin on your messenger work bag and stuff is when someone notices that and they connect to you, you have instantly became a bond because it's such a yeah. specific interest. And I don't think people who wear Beatles t-shirts get that. No, you're right. And yeah. you know. I find also when I was mentoring through Alberta Mentor Foundation for Youth, they always match me with girls and I found that you don't know anything about this person and you know how easy it is to talk to a 15 year old when they first meet you as an adult. So I found that music was the bridge. I would instantly ask them what kind of music they listen to. If they mentioned something, then I start ripping off. Oh yeah, that's so they did this song. They did that. They did this album. They'd look at me like, and then that broke the ice and you had conversations after that. But music is that thing. If you can connect with somebody through music, regardless of what genre, that's, that's a win. But you write about the heavy metal work. I always sometimes feel, especially lately, don't you feel like you're kind of on an island? Because back in the eighties and even the early nineties, we had metal bars. We had all these great ranch bars. I call them like they were always biker bars too, but we had these fabulous ranch bars where they played metal music, live bands, and they're, they're gone. They were replaced by clubs. Not that I don't like the clubs, but they were replaced by clubs and then the raves and all that stuff. So you're right. It's kind of like vanilla. <laughs> the three of us are outliers in a way sometimes i i, I think it is because of youth culture there's so much of that I, I think kids are and like i have a three-year-old and she gets frustrated when she can't color right i've heard that from friends of mine who are art teachers in elementary and middle schools and that kids just get so frustrated with any of the fine arts these days because everything is in some ways you can learn how to do anything on youtube you can use an app on your phone to do most anything but like there's that level of frustration with it I think the other part of it too is, is that if rock stars are supposed to be edgy and dangerous, like when Z Zahid and I are early eighties babies, that's when we were born. So when we were six or seven, like the exploits of Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue, that was what, oh my God, that's what a controversial celebrity does. In 2022, that's not so much the case anymore. The rappers mm -hmm. have taken over the, the demographic of being the cool and I don't have to say dangerous is the right word, but you know what I mean? Like they're the ones who are doing the edgy stuff that it's getting people to talk about. I, I don't even know what, like a big, what nobody's complaining about. It's like, did you see what those guys from Imagine Dragons did when they were at the bar last night? <laughs> there was a, there was a club, like, you know what I mean? There's not those stories. So when you're 12, that's what gets your attention. I mean, they, yeah. you know, it's uh there's a lot towards it. And, but like, I, I know what you mean. And you, you find that stuff. I was in a uh, midtown visiting a client one time and I was walking back to Penn station and there was a dive bar and they were playing typo negative and they were playing it loudly. I don't drink. There's no reason for me to hang out in a bar, but I wanted to go in there because they were playing something off the Bloody Kisses album. And I was like, that sounds like a place that I would like to be. And you know, <laughs> there's always going to be somebody wearing a Rolling Stones t-shirt or some kid trying to butcher a Pink Floyd song, like wish you were here on their acoustic guitar in the backyard. And you're like, dude, just give it up. This isn't going to end well. There's always going to be that, but that's it. You see someone talking about like metal or a sh something on it. And it's, a. Uh, I work at a library. We have teen volunteers. One of them had a stack of CDs. I was like, oh, what are you listening to? So then this kid was like, oh, you've never heard of it. It was this band called Ghost. And I'm like, dude, I was uh, trying to sell the heat on that on 2007-ish and stuff. But like you bond with it. Like, it's like I said, music always finds the right person and gets in the right hands yeah. of it. It does. So. I was volunteering at the food bank in Saskatoon and one of the volunteers there had a Lamb of God shirt. And, you know, as you speak, Barnes, I, I think about like myself and what I would do. And I've noticed that 
I, if I see someone wearing an inflamed shirt at Costco, like an employee or somebody wearing a metal shirt, I will always go out of my way to say, Hey, I like your shirt. Or if it's a tour shirt, I'll be like, Oh, did you get that when they were here in whatever, whatever day or whatever month? It will always spark that conversation. But if I see somebody wearing a Beatles shirt or I don't know, well, they something else, at the concert. <laughs> I, I, I know that they were not at the concert, but I will never comment on that. You know what I mean? They could stand side by side and I would always pick the person that has the metal shirt. I think it goes back to, to being tribal, right? You gravitate mm -hmm. towards people within your collective. So yeah, that's really interesting that you point that out. Mm -hmm. However, I will say I was the only person at Shania Twain's stop in Saskatoon that was wearing an Iron Maiden Fear of the Dark shirt. So. Epic. Okay. But, and I think what you speak about with the tribal this is battle, it's like, here we are all talking about it. We're all cool adults. We're all professionals. We're friendly. We're good members of our community, but metal has whatever reason it's grown most in like an outcast community for yeah. whatever reason. Then the fact that it's like, oh, even if it's a, a metal band that you don't like, it's like, I don't like Lamb of God, but I know they've opened or they open and actually all the bands I like wound up opening for them at some point. So there's this, we have that in common. That means we're practically cousins. It helps us find our community because we have the uniform. <laughs> <laughs> right. And like growing up in like in New Jersey, <clears throat> New Jersey never really had like a major metal scene, but there is a bit of a hardcore one or whatever. So there's a lot of crossover. So you would meet like kids who are into hardcore and like, it would be like, okay, well, we're not too sold on your metalness, but it's okay. Cause we're all kind of outcast cause it's loud music. It's similar enough. If you get a, a legitimate music theory performer, they will tell you it's all the same stuff. Stop arguing over it. But you know, it's all these adjacent scenes that all kind of come together. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. A t-shirt is, that means like you have street credibility. That means that you're cool. I think you're cool. You understand what I like. It's a win-win. So then I... what do you do when somebody, and I think about Kendall Jenner wearing the Slayer shirt and then Gary Holt wearing the Kill the Kardashian shirt. What do you do when there's that, that headbutting of to Kendall Jenner? You're not really in our scene for what it's for. I know this is going to sound crazy, but I'm like. So Kendall Jenner is wearing a Testament shirt or whatever. You know what that means? Like if Testament's getting paid out of this, then good for them. If that means that one kid somewhere is like Testament, what's that? They're going to look it up on Spotify. And yeah. if they're going to cringe and like, this is loud, I don't want this. Or someone's like, you know what? I think this is kind of cool. Then it was all worth it. I know we were talking off air about Nickelback. In my argument to people who were like, I can't believe people like that. Because again, being in America, this is with our weird sibling rivalry with you guys. I think if Nickelback was from Wisconsin, there would be no problem in America with them. But the point I'm getting at is Nickelback was on Roadrunner Records for a long time. They made a ton of money for that record label, which meant so many other bands got an opportunity to be signed, to be promoted, to go on tour or whatever. If you're making money, you're bringing in, it's all adjacent. Nickelback sells, that means another loud rock band is going to get a chance to open for them. It's, yeah. it's, an, it's, it's a very fragile ecosystem. If one of the Kardashians is wearing a Cannibal Corpse t-shirt, that means that they're getting money. That means someone's going to take a second look at other bands. And that's a great way to promote it. I mean, hell, if you were part of that band, wouldn't you do that? I mean, yeah. I jump on, I jump all over that. If the money was there, I don't think any of those bands are seeing a dime from that. However, to Barnes's point, let's just say a, a tween who is looking at Kim Kardashian wearing a Morbid mm -hmm. Angel shirt is like, oh, let me search what Morbid Angel is and then find out it's a band. And maybe it leads to somebody being like, oh, I really like that. I think that absolutely does a service to our community. But then at the same time, when they just do it for no real purpose other than to, to cause conflict, I don't know, it, it hurts my heart because I think maybe I just take it too seriously. What hurts my heart is when I see the kid or the, the person in the Safeway or whatever wearing that metal t-shirt and I say, Hey, I like your shirt. Were you at the concert? And they say, no, I got it in the secondhand store. But that said, some kid picks up a DSI shirt with a crazy picture of Glenn Benton on the back of it. And they go home because they think it looks edgy and they think that's gonna, gonna freak out the squares. If they wind up liking death metal out of it, it's a random side effect that was not anticipated. You know what I, there's that, or it's going to be like, you see it too. I love the Misfits, but at the same time, it feels like the Misfits is almost like a brand at this point. But for every person who bought that because they thought it looked cool and edgy, there's someone else who's going to look at that and then going to Google that instantly. And some kids can be like, oh, this is pretty cool. And I think I like this.
That's great. Much That's money... also PR, isn't it? <laughs> and, 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 and think of it this way. Like, death and thrash metal should never be on keeping up with the Kardashians. There's no organic way. They're wearing those shirts because they're thinking it's edgy and some designer or someone influencer thought it looked interesting or whatever. But that's it. They're getting their eyes, or the rest of the world's getting their eyes on that band logo or that album cover. All publicity is good publicity at that point, right? Yeah, I, I think that's the thing of it, too, is everyone knows that, like, like these celebrities, like, they're not in the, to the scene. They're not into it, whatever. So everyone knows it's not like they're trying to do a crossover thing. It's not like Kendall Jenner's going to record an album with Zach Wilde. Although that would be <laughs> oh, interesting. I would pay for that. I'd pay for that. I mean, we put it out in the universe, so who knows how that's going to happen. But I mean, you can, like, there's, there's two things. The initial, okay, well, roll your eyes. Do they really like this? Probably not. But well, I don't know. Like, you can't judge a book by its cover. I no, mean, that it's very true. I went my whole life, a lot of people, like in my, back in the 90s and you know, early 2000s, nobody took me for a metal fan because of the, you know, I was wearing out, you know, back in those days, you dressed up for the office and stuff until they went by my car and they heard my car just screaming out tool. I, I completely know what you mean. For years, I worked part-time at the Disney store. It's a fun place to work. It was an easy job. I, I like what I did. Cool. But there would be so many times that I would strike up people, you know, oh, Slipknot. Like, yeah, I saw them on their first tour and they were opening for so-and-so and you would see these kids or like, you know. <laughs> or people my new to the disney store who is trying to sell me a tigger t-shirt is telling me about like i don't know the <laughs> the top five children of bodum albums and why it's the best band that you've ever heard <laughs> but you know what like you you never know where you're gonna find that yeah yeah i think as much as people complain about how the internet fragments society because you can find a community for whatever you like for good bad i think it different. brings it together look at but us it also, yes it does because then you can find that like oh there are other people who like this that i do so that means it is cool and that means i don't have to hide all my megadeth t-shirts anymore no we can find our tribe yes you can <laughs> i think that's a great way to end this don't you yeah that's absolutely a great way find your tribe <laughs> <laughs> because it doesn't matter what genre of metal, we're all, you're part of our community. <laughs> yeah, everyone's welcome. Everyone's welcome. Thanks. Well, thanks for very much for having us, Debbie. This was a lot of fun. Oh, you're welcome.